adult Sunday school leader, Hebrews 13.5 states, Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have, because God has said, Never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. You know, this is repeated in the Old Testament in Deuteronomy 31.6 and 8, in Joshua 1.5, and then there are similar thoughts in Joshua 1.9 in Isaiah 41.10. And of course, Jesus promised his disciples in Matthew 28, 20, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And that should be very comforting to us because being abandoned is an awful feeling, isn't it? Especially as a young child, you know, you, you may have had an experience where you got separated from your group and you were on your own, not knowing if you'd ever find your way back to a familiar face. But we are blessed that God said he would never abandon us. And that's what we're looking at this week as we continue in the unit that's called Christ's Return, Living with the End in Mind. This is the second lesson. It's called Know What's Coming, out of Matthew 24, verses 15 through 22. And the point of this lesson is, even in the darkest times, God has not abandoned his people. Well, we're in Matthew 24 and 25 for a total of six weeks, and we began this unit last week when Jesus' disciples asked him about the destruction of the temple. When would that be, and what was going to be the sign of the end of the age? And as we said last week, Jesus didn't give a date, but he did mention some events that were going to take place. And he mentioned false messiahs, wars, earthquakes, famines, all of which was going to be the beginning of birth pains. And then he mentioned about people falling away from the faith and persecution. And lastly, he said the gospel would be preached in the whole world, and then the end would come. So it appears that in those first 14 verses, Jesus answered the question of what will be the signs of the end of the age? Now, we talked last week about how Jesus went back and forth in these prophecies, foretelling things to come in the near future as well as the distant future. And so I'm going to be giving my thoughts on this. And, and regardless of how you teach it, however you interpret the sequence of events presented in our lessons uh, in the upcoming few weeks, there's most likely going to be someone in your class who disagrees. That's okay. Let's just make sure we understand that the sequence of end-time events should not be a test of fellowship, all right? Solid cases can really be made for just about every interpretation uh, about what's going to take place and when it's going to happen. Some people have their charts and their graphs, and they think they have it all figured out, and if that's you, then that's great. <laughs> I don't, okay? I have my thoughts, but I'm not dogmatic about my beliefs concerning the end-time events. Now, I personally believe that the first part of our passage this week solely deals with the near future events that's going to happen just about 35 years or so after Jesus speaks this in about the year 70. To me, to me, the geographical and the cultural references that Jesus makes points to that. However, I could be wrong. I'd be the first to admit that. I could be wrong. And I'd enjoy hearing any other thoughts you have on this. You can always leave me a YouTube comment or email me at the address given at the end of this video. All right, so let's dive into Matthew 24. Verse 15 doesn't start off with the word then. Then you will see. It says, but when, when you see. Okay, to me, this indicates that it's not necessarily a continuation of the end of the age, of when the end of the age will be, but it's a separate thought. Answering the disciples' question, when will the destruction of the temple take place? And Jesus spoke of the abomination that causes desolation. That's referenced in Daniel chapter 9, 27, uh, 11, 31, and 12, 11. And I'm sure the Jews probably thought this had already happened in 168 BC when Antiochus Epiphanes sacrificed a pig to Zeus in the temple. But it also happened in AD 70 when the Roman army destroyed and desecrated the temple. We talked a little bit about that last week. There's also a future interpretation to this, as, as seen in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1-4. through 4. It says this, Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and being gathered to him, we ask you, brothers and sisters, not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by the teaching allegedly from us, whether by prophecy or word of mouth or by letter, asserting that the day of the Lord has already come. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed, uh, the man doomed to destruction. Here we go. He will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped. 
so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. Well, the reason I believe that Jesus is speaking of the Romans in AD 70 is because of the references he makes in verses 17 through 20. They seem to be specific to Jewish culture in the first century. First of all, he specifically mentions those in Judea. They should flee to the mountains. Well, what does that have to do with anybody else in the world, especially in contemporary America? Right. Also, the roof of houses then were flat, and they were used kind of like a den or a family room for relaxing. And Most houses today don't have that feature. And when Jesus said, come down off your roof and immediately flee, don't go in for your belongings, that made more sense to that culture and not us. And then in verse 20, he said, pray that your flight will not take place in winter or on the Sabbath. Well, during the winter in the Middle East, the creeks and the rivers were swollen with water, and it would be quite difficult to, to cross those bodies of water. And if it happened on a Sabbath, of course, you, know, you had those Sabbath rules about how far one could travel, and all those Jewish businesses that sold those much-needed supplies, or, or they were going to be closed. So these are the things that makes me think that Jesus is referring to the Roman destruction of the temple that would happen, like I said, about 35 years after he speaks these words. But then again, there could even be, even be further implications as well. And, and here's why. We look in verse 21 and it says, For then there will be great distress, unequaled from the beginning of the world until now, and never to be equaled again. Well, if Jesus was referring only to the A.D. 70 destruction of the temple, well, yes, thousands of Jews were killed, many more fled the area. But what about the atrocities of World War II? Surely that was much more distressful and horrendous than what happened 1900 years before. See, this isn't an easy study, and I doubt that we'll ever fully understand everything about the Bible, of course, this side of heaven. But but we need studies like this, don't we, to stretch us, to make us think, to make us honestly examine our belief in what I call those non-essentials of the faith. Not maybe, to, not maybe to be so dogmatic about them and maybe to be open to some correction. But the main crux of this lesson is there in the last verse, in verse 22. It says, If those days had not been cut short, no one would survive, but for the sake of the elect, those days will be shortened. Here we see the mercy of God. It's for the sake of the elect, for the church, that God will cut those days short. If that terrible time went on without any end, no one would survive. So when suffering comes, we need to remember that God is in control. It may not seem like it, but he's in control. He will not allow the church to be obliterated from the face of the earth. There is always going to be at least a remnant of believers to carry on until his return. I read a statement today that I thought really summed it up nicely. God is ultimately in charge of history, and he will not allow evil to exceed the bounds he has set. Again, I'll admit this is a difficult lesson, but, but let's do our best in our preparation. If we can present it to the best of our ability to our class and then facilitate discussion around God's word. That's all for this week. Don't forget to pray for and with your class. I appreciate you guys watching very much.